Hey everybody, welcome to episode 103 of the Ask Dab Show, where I answer your Volkswagen and Audi questions. On this episode, we talk about swapping an Audi TTRS engine into a 2.5 Jetta, reliability of the 2.8 V6 engine, and performance pack electronic limited slip retrofits on GTIs. Okay, so before we get into our questions, as you can see, this is kind of a new backdrop of what you would expect to see on one of our videos if you're familiar with us. Uh, if you're new, welcome. And this is actually the start of our new location. We actually are in the process of, of uh, going to be building out here. If you can see behind me, this is pretty much just an empty shell, which is why we get a little bit of an echo here. Uh, and we're tr trying to get as little echo as possible here. But we will have some stuff coming in the future, checking out the new facility as we kind of build through, we'll probably check out some stuff. Um, and and uh, I was, it has been requested that we do kind of a tour. I said maybe once, once we get through this build out, we'll do kind of a tour of, of our new setup. With that said, let's get into our questions. Tony Pepperoni via Vortex says, another great one regarding the downshift braking, would this be even less of an issue with the DSG as it rev matches and all, or could it still wear the clutch plates? Okay, so Tony's question was actually asked on a video that I shot talking about uh, downshifting and does it on a manual trans, does it affect your clutch? And so his question is about DSGs and does using the paddle shifters uh, on you know that particular car, which would be a Mark 7, would using your paddle shifters or downshifting manually on a DSG affect your clutch pack wear? Um, much like the answer to that question, technically using that yes, the answer would be yes, it would put more uh, strain potentially, but because DSGs actually rev match on their own, they're actually going to put you in the kind of the optimal downshift point. So the fact that that's actually happening makes me think that it's probably not going to cause wear. It actually might do a better job on the clutch packs than, than what you would see on a manual because it's actually specifically rev matching based on speed and all that stuff so when you're selecting the gear so uh, the car is generally smarter than we are when it comes to selecting uh you know rev match that type of stuff so i would say it's probably less likely of an issue on that than it would be on a manual and then even on that car was not really something that i'd be concerned about mike via youtube says i have a question and i've been trying to find answers on a volkswagen jetta is it possible to put an RS3 or TTRS 2.5T engine in a Mark V Jetta? Okay, so we often get questions like this, and, and what I think Mike's basically asking is, can you put a TTRS engine into a 2.5, but is it drop-in? And, and so I think that there's a lot of misconceptions about what swapping an engine really means, and understanding the fact that they're both, both five-cylinder engines, but they're so drastically different. One of them is a forced induction engine, one of them is a naturally aspirated engine. And so they're so far apart that it's not really something that you're going to expect to see something you drop in and just plug, 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 you're done. Uh, first of all, I would expect there to be probably some fabrication that's gonna to need to happen, even though they are similar body platforms, especially if you're going from a uh, Mark II TTRS because they are based on the same platform, the kind of Mark V, Mark VI platform. Uh, but you're going to have a lot more complication. And I know there are a lot of people who build five cylinder turbo engines. Uh, so, and I would say it's probably going to be the more cost effective route is to build a five cylinder turbo, but you know, build the bottom end, get a manifold, downpipe, all that stuff made, and then uh, get software tuned for a 2.5 uh, big turbo engine as opposed to trying to get a TTRS engine unless you just have one by chance. But I would suspect that any TTRS engine is probably worth four or $5,000 minimum, I would think, uh, just in the, in the used market because they're pretty rare. So if somebody blows a TTRS engine, they're gonna have to pony up to pay for one. And a brand new engine, you know, just a, a long block, I would guess is probably 10 grand, just, just off the top of my head. Um, so I would say if you're looking to build something like that, you wanna go down the road of build the bottom end, add a turbo to it, um, get it tuned, and then you'll end up with a product that is a much more cost-effective way to build a big turbo engine. If you want the, the drivability that you get from having a factory one and maybe just take a TTRS engine and tune it, yeah, that's awesome. I don't see it being cost-effective, but for the right person, I think it, it might make sense. Tim via YouTube says, 
I think the 30 valve V6 or the AHA motor was built to last and pretty reliable, and it was in the Passat. I had a B5 A4 Quattro with 260,000 miles on it, and all I had to do was normal maintenance. So this comment was actually left on a video that I shot talking about the top five reliable VW and Audi engines or VW engines. Uh, and I actually agree with Tim in, in the sense that the three, uh, 30 valve 2.8 liter V6, which came in uh, B5 Passat and then Audi A4s of that same kind of year range, they were very reliable engines. I actually, I actually think they were pretty good other than the fact that they had timing belts that were expensive to replace for most people. They were kind of a tough pill to swallow, but a lot of a lot of engines do, so that's not really as much of a concern. But for me, the biggest concern why it doesn't really fall within that is because that video was talking about reliable models, and B5s were not a reliable model. They had control arm issues and axle issues and a bunch of other stuff, water leaks and all, a whole slew of problems that were unrelated to what the engine that was in the car, which is why, to me, it's not... As, best, as good of a choice as some of the other models that I talked about in that video. So, uh, but I do completely agree that that 2.8, while it wasn't the most exciting engine, it was a pretty solid engine. As long as you maintained it properly, it would just continue to go. So, uh, and you fix the valve cover gaskets because they would leak like crazy uh, pretty often. Flava Flav via YouTube says, can you install one of these in a non-performance pack Mark 7 GTI affordably? Okay, so this question came from a recent video that I shot talking about uh, performance pack differentials, basically explaining how Mark said performance pack diffs work. I'll link to that video here where you can check that out. I feel like it was a pretty good video, but it's not really something that everybody is mainstream looking for. So it really uh, didn't do as well as I hoped or thought it might do, uh, I guess just because performance pack diffs are not really something mainstream for all VW lovers. So, uh, but with that said, he's asking about retrofitting. So I've had this question a lot more and as I've done a lot more research preparing for that video to make sure that obviously I put out uh, as accurate information as possible, I have a little more detail about this that I think can shed some light on retrofitting a performance pack diff onto a, a GTI that didn't have one. So performance pack diffs have basically a module that's separate from the transmission and it has a, a pump on it and all that such stuff. But what makes it possible to actually li link the differential of the one side axle and the other side axle together is it actually splines with the housing of the differential. And so the problem is the diff in performance pack cars or, or vehicles that have the, the electronic LSD, they use a different differential, at least based on part number. Now, I assume I haven't taken one apart firsthand, but I assume because of the way it splines, it's probably a different setup than what you would find in a factor, uh, the normal differential that would come in just the standard transmission. So with that said, I suspect, and again, keep in mind this is speculation, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident that this is true. You would actually need to change the differential before you can add that module and pump and all that stuff on top of it, along with the fact that it, the ABS system actually would have to be integrated in some way for uh, the way they interact with each other because they, they all work closely together. So you need to have all that stuff working. So, you know, there's a million reasons why, but I think this, all that information, the fact you need to change the diff anyway, along with the cost associated with it, makes it, to me, not even close to making sense. You, it's probably way more cost effective to just buy a wave track diff, which, you know, I'll link to them in the description for all the wave track diffs, but you have to break the trans case open anyway, so it's not like you're getting an ease of installation of that diff as a retrofit. So, you know, and that doesn't even count for all the headaches around getting the coating properly to make sure everything talks to each other correctly, uh, you know, as aside from the actual mechanical problems with that. So it's a cool idea, but I'm not sure it's super practical. Thanks so much for watching episode 103 of the Ask Dap Show, where I answer your Volkswagen Audi questions. If you have any questions or comments about the questions answered in this show, be sure to leave in the comments below. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more like this.